Hi, everyone. Welcome to Q&A with Melvin Bragg, um, legendary broadcaster, novelist, and um, all-out media figure, and a great guy, of course. Um, we're going to start with uh, 10 minutes just from him talking about sort of like uh, his like, career progression and like his life. Um, and then we'll spend uh, maybe 20 minutes uh, Q&A from me and Gaia, my co-host. And then if you uh, want to ask any questions, uh, you can message them to me or her. Um, if, you want, uh, if you want us to read it out for you in the second half, we'll do 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, just message it privately um, and we'll read it out. Uh, if you want it to, if you want to read it out yourself, uh, just message it in the general chat, and uh, we'll call on you when, when we want uh, you to ask the question, uh, and you can unmute to ask it. Great. So, um, hello everyone from me, and a very warm welcome to today's Oxford Blue Journalism Masterclass, where Ollie, as you said, and I, and um, we're both editors at the paper, are absolutely delighted to be hosting um, this q and with Kevin Bragg. Um, it's an undeniably difficult task to try and summarise Melvin's career in a few short words. But among his very many essays, he's written more than three dozen books, fiction and non fiction. You've broken up, I'm afraid. Oh, is that me? It's or awful for you. Uh, Ollie, you have to while I'm talking. I think it might be from. Uh, if everyone I'm afraid as you were speaking, you know, the sound broke up. It's It's. Must be rotten for you, but that's what's happening. And yeah. uh, even with headphones on, I, I can't hear. So I, think I know it, my. It might be some. Is that okay now? Okay, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, it's a bit better. Okay. Um, okay. Well, anyway, so um, um, Melvin's many achievements. He's um, been uh, he's won many literary prizes. He's written many screenplays, among them Jesus Christ Superstar. He's very well known as a broadcaster, joining the BBC in the early 1960s after graduating from Wadham College, Oxford, where he read history. He wrote, conceived and presented The South Bank Show, an arts TV programme that aims to bring both high art and popular culture to its listeners. If I'm not mistaken, um, the programme has almost 800 episodes and has been awarded more than 110 awards, including 12 BAFTAs. Probably my favourite radio show of all time, um, Melvin is, of course, very well known for In Our Time, a radio show that airs almost every Thursday morning um, since it started in 1998. The show was originally given what was then known as a death slot, um, it being quite early in the morning on a Thursday. But thanks to the winning combination of exceptionally high quality information from the academics that it hosts, always kept lively and interesting by Melvin's presenting style, um, but never fails to point out when he's sort of bored and frustrated by the academics. The programme has now received a weekly audience exceeding 2 million listeners, and that's not even counting the huge amount of people who access the show as a podcast on streaming sites. Melvin was made a life peer under Tony Blair's Labour government, and he also served as the president of MIND, a mental health charity, for 15 years. So, Melvin, thank you very much for joining us, and I'll now hand over to you, unless my audio is broken up. Thank you very much. Um... What I just, when Oliver and I decided that I would do <laughs> is to start for five or ten minutes talking, so I'd say very briefly about what I did at school, how I came to Oxford, and what my first job was, not some sort of platform, and then just dive in, ask what you want, and thank you very much for that generous introduction. I went to a grammar school in the northwest of England. I was, I was uh, allowed to go, as it were, by the Butler Act which meant that people from my sort of background, which is a working class background, didn't have to pay. And it was a time when a lot of us went there and there was a new feeling, even at the grammar school. It was a boys school when I went to it. Then it, uh, girls, thank goodness, came in in the third year, the girls high school across the road, and we became one much bigger school. The teachers, and I was very, I've, one of the themes of what I'm going to say is luck. Um, and I've had such luck and that's the big thing that people are always telling you. Um, but my luck was the teachers. One teacher was a, a very small, extremely determined, grim Yorkshireman who kept donkeys and had been uh, in, in Czechoslovakia in the Second War for reasons why he never told us. Uh, he played uh, cricket for the town until he was 69, uh, slow left arm spinner, and he um, 
told us, he taught us English by telling us we read it. We read aloud everything. We read Hazlitt, we read Shakespeare, we read the war poets, we read aloud everything. And then he made us write uh, in, in, in a very, very definite way. We didn't mess about. I'll have three poems from you, Bragg, uh, by next Thursday. Uh, can be in sonnet form, 14 lines, good enough for Shakespeare, good enough for you. Next Thursday, three. All right? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, and that, he was one of them. Two, a magnificent history teacher who was, had been born in Mag Madagascar, the son of a missionary. And he came to England and didn't see his parents for 12 years because they were missionaries and he was over here. And then he went into the Air Force, was a Spitfire pilot uh, and did reconnaissance work. He never told us until I left school that he was a Spitfire pilot. If he did, we'd have fallen at his feet. As it was, we just thought he was an extremely severe <laughs> teacher, which he was, uh, but a very, very good teacher. He drilled things into us. And I think the missionary thing from his background carried over when he came to Wigton, a little small market town on an, on, in, near the industrial belt of Cumbria. I think it came as a stepping stone to something else. But I think he saw, I know he saw, because he told me about it in an interview I did with him later. A lot of people who hadn't had a chance and he was going to make sure they had a chance and that became his mission. And he started to get people into Oxford, uh, not only myself, but a train of people following by the toughness of his teaching. So there was him and the headmaster, uh, Methodist minister, son of a Methodist minister, son of a Methodist minister, who'd gone to the school that I went to, all of them. And he was a barking, uh, I don't barking man, he barked at you all the time. And uh, was a very serious and severe man. And again, again, a good teacher, so that was luck. Because of them, I got into Oxford uh, and, um, it was another landscape. It's difficult now when things have changed so much in my life and in many people's lives. I mean, four or five percent of the uh, 18 year olds, whatever it was, got into universities and therefore a smaller percent got into Oxford. It was extraordinary. I mean, the buildings were extraordinary. I thought I'd ended up in King Arthur's court, just walking around the place. Um, and the people in flash cars and the Viscounts in Christchurch who sped up to London on Friday night for the parties. It was a completely another world. And the libraries, I remember going to Queen's College Library and seeing a man, a young man, take down books from the shelves and open them and start to read them. And I thought, you wouldn't, you shouldn't take them down. They're too valuable. You're not supposed to do that with them. You're supposed to look at the spines and move on. I really did think those things. I was, I was a Yankee at King Arthur's court. And I was very, uh, very ignorant of what went on, but I didn't feel repelled by it. I felt a bit of an outsider, but not for very long. Uh, there were good people from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, from public school backgrounds, grammar school backgrounds, people had come over from America and so on. And I was lucky that I played rugby, so I played in a rugby team for a year and sang in a choir for a year, and you make a lot of friends there, and that takes care of that side of things. What I did in Oxford, which changed me, we'd done drama at school, but not on the level they did it at Oxford. And Ken Loach was there when I was there, and various other people, and they really knew what they were about. And we did The Tempest, we toured Germany for eight weeks with The Tempest. Uh, we did all sorts, of, all sorts of plays. We made a film, the first film since Tony Richardson, who made uh, Tom Jones had been there, he'd, he'd, he'd uh, bankrupted the film society so they stopped films being made. But we said we could make it on a one-to-one -one ratio for Fortnum's Hapney and they believed us and we more or less did. And well, our film was called All Together Boys, shot by a man called Gavin Miller who went on to film, make feature films and so on. And I was a significant central figure dressed in black, which was very annoying because I got to go and buy a black shirt. Uh, at a place called, I can't remember it was, somewhere, somewhere, I'm in Carfax, where you could get cheap shirts. Anyway, so I was very significant in that film. I didn't say anything, of course. Um, we got an American jazz drummer to do the soundtrack to it, and it was cacophony, and <laughs> somehow, <laughs> I think deliberately, Gavin lost it, and it's never been seen since, which is a pity, because all sorts of people were in it. Richard Ingram was in it. <laughs> we, everybody wanted to be in it. So I did the film, and roved around uh, it was it, it, so many different things you could do it was like being in a you know being a sweet shop addicted to sweets that was what oxford was and also i could get on with being taught by amazing tutors again i was lucky one of my tutors was Lawrence stone a very very great uh, late medieval and, and 17th century 16th 17th century historian and on it went so that was oxford and then I was going for a job uh, I, I i got married before i took my driver and, uh, and I had to get a job. Uh, and so I went to the place where you got a job, a little office in the broad, tiny little office. 
and a rather laconic man said, oh, there's, there's jobs over there. So the first job I applied for was the Blythe Iron and Steel Works um, up in Northumberland. And thank God I didn't get it. And another one I applied for was an advertising agency in Mayfair, where David turned out that David Putnam went, and David Bailey went, and Alan uh, Parker went. Uh, but I failed to get in. Um, but I eventually got into the BBC traineeship, general traineeship. They gave three a year. Sorry, Melvin, I think you froze for a bit. Um, Gaius, he frozen for you too. Yeah, he has. Sorry, I thought it was me who had frozen. Um, I will just wait till he comes back. I wish, yeah, I, was, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, wish I was a copy of that film. Um, I'd absolutely love to watch it. Feels like a massive yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, he's left, so I think he's probably having some connection problems. Um, so if everyone just sort of mm. prepares with. Um, in the meantime, if anyone uh, is thinking about questions, do put them in the chat um, for later on in the in this session when we can um, ask Melvin questions. Um, if you'd prefer not to ask them yourself, as Ollie said earlier, um, message them to us individually on the Zoom chat and then we can read them out for you. Sorry, Melvin, we lost you there for, for a second. Is he back? Can you, can you hear us again? Um, I think he might have actually left. Uh, He's joined again. Oh, okay. Okay, there you go. Is that all right? Don't go too far. I think it might. Well, whatever. Can, can, you hear you? can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. You just cut out. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So I, I, I got this interview for uh, a uh, traineeship at uh, it, for the BBC, <laughs> and um, there were wonderful things to get, and I, had, I thought I would never have a chance in, in the world of getting it, but I got to the last six, uh, and uh, I went for my interview, and again, it was very good. Look, I always had a paperback in my pocket, mostly bought at Oxfam. You could get them for sixpence. And uh, I didn't have one in my pocket for the trade journey. And I, I felt rather sort of like somebody needing a sandwich. So I bought a copy of the Times. It's just, I think, the first copy of the Times I'd ever bought. I bought many since before and read it thoroughly and got there. And so that was one thing. So I went to the interview and it was going okay. And then I had the second stroke of luck. There was a man called Martin Eslin who was there. He was uh, one of the many uh, brilliant uh, Jewish intellectuals who'd come over to England. He ran the drama at the BBC. He'd written about Pinter. He'd written about, sorry, Beckett. He'd, he ran about Pinter eventually. Beckett, Joyce, and so on. And he was he's quite sulky because he was a substitute for somebody else. He did not want to be there. And by that time, neither did I. Um, and he asked me some good questions, which were so off piste because I'd read history about difference between Beckett and Joyce and that, and I stumbled through some sort of answers. And I, <laughs> I think he thought, well, I was game, if nothing else. But I wasn't doing okay until it came to the chairman, who we knew specialised in a killer question. And the killer question was, can you tell me what you know about Albania? You're not going to forget that. I'm not going to forget that, am I? Unfortunately for him, I had read the same article in the Times that morning about Albania that he had read. And because I was in an exam mode and had a reasonably good memory, I sort of more or less summarized it and gave it to him. He looked very crestfallen. He hadn't expected that result. Anyway, I got that job. And it was like paradise. I mean, I, I didn't believe that were jobs like this. I went into the World Service. These brilliant men, uh, um, Conrad, uh, uh, Ludwig Gottlieb, Tosca Feibel, who'd worked with George Orwell on Tribune, on Tribune, was full of those sort of people, and they were helpful. They, you were pieces for them, which they then broadcast in 30, 20, 40, sorry, 42 different languages. And it was just, they were charming people and helpful. Then I went to, and I ended up, I went to various radio things, and I ended up, they wanted me to go to television. You're supposed to go around everything. Well, that time I was enjoying radio so much. I was working with Louis McNeese. I worked with him on translation of uh, uh, just, I mean, when I say worked with him, I sort of sat in the corner. Uh, I, I worked with a man who commissioned uh, um, Dylan Thomas to do Under Milk Wood. It was, can you imagine? I, you know, just because there was a trainer, oh, send him up to there, send him up to Douglas, send him up to Louis. Oh, oh what's he doing this? Oh, send him over there. So I got all that. And then, uh, and then I had to go to television, which I did not want to go to. 
I'd been brought, we didn't have much of a television until I was too old, to be, uh, until I was at the university. So um, I went, the only program I'd seen was Monitor, an arts program, uh, on somebody else's television of the three. So I went grumpily for an interview and Hugh Weldon, who was running Monitor, had been, it got lots of medals in, in the Second World War. A lot of people, it was a Second World War atmosphere about it. You expected it almost to be big in Hill. They were all going to get in Spitfires and take off again. That sort of atmosphere. He had his feet on the table, of course. So I was looking at the soles of his shoes in a rather low seat. And he was bored out of his mind. He couldn't stop the, and he went, because he was known for not wanting to take trainees. But I'd been emphatic, that's the only program I wanted to go on. And then, and then he said, if I went on a program at all. And then he said, well, why do you want to come on this program? And I was a bit pissed off with him as he was obviously fed up with me. So I said, I don't, I don't want to come on it. I've got to, it's part of the thing. I've got to come on it. I'm having a good time in radio. I don't want to come here. And he thought that was the funniest thing he'd heard since breakfast or something. He almost fell off his chair. And I was hired, hired immediately. <laughs> it's silly, isn't it? Happens to be accurate. And then that John Selesnyi was making films for Monitor, Ken Ross was making films for Monitor. We made films about all the artists you could think of and just imagine uh, what it was like. Well, it was wonderful. And I got to make films soon, quite soon, and then set up my own program. BBC Two started, which was another stroke of luck, which they needed hands on deck. They didn't have enough people. BBC had bidded for BBC Two to block ITV uh, in order to stop ITV getting a second channel. And then to their dis dismay, they got this second channel, but they hadn't anybody to do it. So people like me, who are just still green behind the ears, were hiked out to, to do programmes on BBC Two, which we had low budgets, but masses of space. And I got a few pals together, people I'd met uh, around the place, and we had a wonderful time for a couple of years. So that's how I started. That's the background. And I've gabbled on a bit, but... Uh, there you go. No, that was um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I guess kind of hearing you talk about uh, Joyce and Beckett and you know arts more generally. Um, obviously, you've written quite a few novels, and I was wondering. Um, oh, I forgot to say, I, I'd started to write at Oxford. I wrote some stories which I hadn't the nerve to send to ISIS. I wrote a novel which, when I came down from Oxford, I sent to Faber and Faber, and they sent a very very polite refusal, <laughs> rejection. Rejection letter. Oh yeah, so yeah, and, and yeah, so I, I want to come on to rejection later, but um, I, I guess just as an opening question, what would you say your kind of uh, heroes um, are, whether they're literary heroes or people who you admire um, or you looked up to during your early stages of your career? Well, it's a very good question, but I haven't got any sort of an answer. Uh, it is a really good question. I mean, my hero tends to be the person I've read quite recently who impressed me most, or the film I've seen quite recently which impressed me most. They, 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 they go around. I mean, the, the, it's, it's silly to say the, the great people impress you all the time, but they do. And you have to say it because the great writers, the great playwrights, the, they, the Chekhov's always impressing, impressive. And so it goes. But I am... I, um, I, I've always liked the multitude of things. I've always liked a lot of a lot coming in. So I can't help you very much there. Um, and I, I I I went on the rampage about American fiction when I was about sixteen or seventeen and read as much as I could. Then on French fiction, read in English, read the translation, let's get it. And then on Russian. Uh, and each time I thought, well, this is this is it. There's nobody as good as these people. So I can't give you a simple answer, which is awful, really. But I can't. No, I think that's probably a better answer. Um, so I suppose over lockdown, what have you been reading and uh, watching? What's kind of influencing you at the moment? Well, lockdown's been okay for me, which is awful, because I have been over the last three years pretty ill. I'm a couple of cancers and a, what's it called? Uh, collapsed lung and uh, all that sort of stuff. It's all better now. It's all pneumonia. It's all better. I'm, I'm through it all. But so that meant that <laughs> I was quite used to being on my own. Um, and so lockdown was when I was getting better. Uh, so that was good. I, I started another book, uh, 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 it's, it's, which I finished about, uh, I, I sent to the publishers uh, 10 days ago. It's uh, a memoir, not only about me, but about the town in which I was brought up uh, between 19, it's, it's set between 1946 when I was six and 1957 when I went to Oxford, 758 when I went to Oxford. Um, and, um, it's encapsulating that town, which is in England, that's completely gone. It's wholly gone. That's where I was brought up in this small town of 5,000 people, 12 churches, two factories, 
a little bit of gentry, a bit of middle class, lots of sports, lots of clubs, which is was I thought was fantastic. Uh, uh, there was so much to do, so many pals. I wanted I wanted to just sort of present that, not to present, recall it. And so I didn't do any research, which is a silly thing, because I like doing research, but I thought, I'll just see what I can remember, because what I can remember might be the best, uh, the best things that happened and the worst thing that happened. If I can remember them, that gives, I, they, they've stuck there somewhere. So I did it that way. And uh, God knows, publisher might turn it down. I was, I was actually about, just about to ask you um, what you're working on at the moment, but I guess that answers that and begs another question. Like, you're such a prolific writer alongside your, your media career. Like how, I mean, how do you manage to fit it all in? And how do you, do you ever take breaks between your writings? Yes, when you say prolific, you ought to, actually, not you ought to, <laughs> take into account, Meg Ray wrote 800 novels. And Gide says, and, uh, uh, from my limited French art degree, I mean, he should have had the Nobel Prize. And Gide said, he was, Andre Gide said that Meg Ray was the best stylist in the French language. Um, when you talked about what Dickens wrote, when you talked about, I'm not comparing myself, you know, of course, but there are lots of people, there are, some writers write, write a lot, some writers write a little, some writers write a, who write a lot, do some good stuff, much do bad stuff. Some writers write a little, do terrible stuff. I, I do write, I, when the question comes, you think, oh God, does that mean I've written too much? I like writing. I like the, what I like about book is I like the writing of it. I like sitting down for three or four hours and just writing. Uh, and then there's the publishing, which is nail biting. Then there's like, I am at the moment, waiting to see what the publishers think of it. Whether <laughs> <laughs> and then the critics say, oh, God, I can, you know, they'll have a go. Of course they will. And so on. But I like writing. Uh, I've had very, uh, I had quite a broad childhood. Um, most of it was lived above a pub, well, a beer house, really, which was noisy downstairs and beer barrels and quite a few fights and stuff. And I'm upstairs on my own. And uh, then I had a very bad breakdown. I was 13 or 14, a, re a very serious crack up. Um, and I... Bought that because I couldn't tell anybody in those days. You can tell anybody um, by by forcing myself to be on my own by going for long walks by just forcing it so that I didn't have another one, and uh, and I got through that. And what 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 made it work was that I started to work very hard at stuff that I got from school from these school teachers and started to write. Um, uh, right, what, what I don't even wouldn't even call it poetry, but but hopelessly I can still remember some of the poems and I'm not going to repeat them now. Um, and that seemed to do something. And I, I, I did it ever since I was 14 or 15, sitting there writing on my own was okay. Things were okay. And then all the rest, because I like, we, we had a, we had a, a group, uh, a skiffle group called the Memphis Five <laughs> over in Ripton. Uh, we didn't have many engagements, but uh, we made a lot of noise anyway. But that, so, so I'm writing all the time. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's, I probably written too much and rewritten too little, although I rewrite a lot now. And there's a lot of hours in the day. And I don't have a day when I'm not working, not because I'm a workaholic, but because I like what I'm doing. And I think that's the, by a rambling, a rambling, a, a ramble, I've come to what I really want to say. The, the, and I, it is about luck, this answers to your questions. And I have never talked like this before because I, I know I'm talking to people who were my age when I was where you are, where you are now. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's something strange that clicks into you. And I thought this is a lifeline writing. Um, I'm sort of talking to myself without scaring the life out of myself. I'm trying to conjure up things that I know must be there, but I won't know they're there until I've written them down. Um, and so it's something that began to be almost an addiction, really. Um, but addiction makes something sound as if it's of a lower order. Uh, you know, De Quincey addiction, drugs. It isn't that sort. It's, it's when there's a sense of, I mean, I'm talking, there's a sense of it's okay everything's okay. I'm writing about these other people or, or, or sometimes in, in, in autobiographical fiction about a sort of me and, and the people I knew and so on. And it's okay. And everything's, then I can do everything else. 
because that noise go back there. So, yeah, how do I fit it in? It's because, to go back to your question, um, I, I, I mean, I, I started off with one job, the uh, television job, and was writing. Uh, but the main thing is our point I was trying to get to, and I lost it halfway through, is that I, I really liked the work I did outside writing. And that, I was brought up with people, almost everybody, who did work they didn't, they would not chosen to have do, to have done. They wouldn't have chosen it for a minute, but they landed up with it, and that was the way. And they put up with it, and they made they spun terrific lives out of it, and all sorts of things they did, and ways they spoke, and uh, objects they achieved, objectives they achieved in their life were quite wonderful. I had the luck of landing on my feet doing exactly what I wanted to do. In fact. I didn't know I wanted to do it as much until I knew it, until I got it. I mean, to go into television when I was 20, 21, 22 and start making radio programs with, and then start making television films, writing films for Ken Russell and Sessinger and all that sort of thing, it was, a, it was almost a fantasy. Um, and it was every day I got out of bed to get into the studio, to get into the cutting room, to get onto location. So work was, a, in that sense, uh, an energizer. And I think that if you do things you like doing, it gives you energy for the next thing. And when I came back in the evening from work, uh, I would just, uh, Lisa and I, my first wife, would we, I'd have supper and then I'd go into the next room and start writing um, or reading. It was reading or writing or work. Uh, but the work was keeping you up all the time. And that, so if there's an explanation, um, it's a, and I'm not trying to be in the slightest bit boastful about it. It's just the way it is. I like writing and um, and making television films and making television arts programs because I was interested in writers and I was interested in, in painters. And at school, I, I got a bit of it, but not a lot of it. And interest, very interested in music. I sang in choirs and uh, as I had a group, <laughs> sort of played the piano until until I, I, I packed it in or it packed me in. Um, and uh, so there was all that there. It was like kindling. When you're in the scouts, I was in the scouts as well. <laughs> you, you put the stuff, but then you light the match and stand back and hope to God the, the wood isn't too damp. Uh, and the papers, there's enough paper to get it going. It was ready to go from school and from university. And all of a sudden the doors opened and there it was, meeting these people, talking to these people doing research about these people, making films about these people, asking questions of Norman Mailer, Gore Vidal, uh, Saul Bellow, um, Francis Bacon, on and on and on it went. I think we've done about 900 South Bank shows. Uh, and then we did a series beside it. We, I did something called The Adventure of English, The History of the English Language, and so on and so forth. It was just a delight, more than a delight. Now that's too soft a word. It was terrific to do, it was thrilling to do because you were finding stuff out all the time. And I suppose basically to that 13 or 14 year old when I was in such a mess. I mean, I was sent down from school from 3A to 3L. L was where the serious duds went. And then I was told I had to leave school and go to the secondary mob um, because I was so disruptive and all that. Oh, it's in actually, oddly enough, quite a bit of that's in the new book. But um, this, this being able to concentrate on what you loved and found, find out more about it and then meet the people, you know, <laughs> was in danger of turning my head, for goodness sake. <laughs> Do you have, um, a, like, I think Isabella Simpson asked, uh, what, if you have a favorite memory from Oxford, and um, I kind of like in, like in line with that, when we were talking earlier, I was wondering about also how your experience like writing film reviews when you were an undergrad sort of like allowed you to build that outlet of writing. I wonder if those two are intermeshed. Sorry, I didn't quite get the question. I was shifting my earphones. Um, do you have, Isabella Simpson asked if you had a favourite memory from Oxford. Yeah. And I, and I, wanted, to, I wanted to add to that um, what we were talking about with the film reviews earlier that you used to write for the Charwell and whether you think that student journalism was important to you to develop that creative outlet? I think film, film, student journalism was essential to me 
Uh, we were the editor of Sharma was the man who went on to be editor of the Guardian for 35 years, and uh, he, <laughs> our offices were in a converted public lavatory next to the Union, and we had to deliver our stuff. And he was firm. And then the, the arts editor was Michael Billington, so I said I, I should take my film reviews to Michael, who sat back in a, in a Robin Day. You're know, too young to know about Robin Day mode, and, and and was very keen to slash sentences out of uh, a source that always the best sentences out of what I'd written. It was very, very important. I mean, meeting a deadline, then seeing your stuff in print. You're seeing your stuff in print. Isn't, isn't oh, that's me in print. It's, it's kind of, I can do it. I can do it. And that really matters. It's there. Charwood is a properly printed newspaper. And there's other writers alongside in their different pages with bigger spreads. It doesn't matter. I can do it. I think that's really important. Uh, and also working to a deadline is important. You have to get it in by, I can't remember, say Wednesday at five o'clock, something like that. Um, and that's important. You know, the same with essays, but not quite as tight as Charwell. Now, working for student journalism was, 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 was a, a very, very good, uh, was good fun. And you got into the pictures free, but it was a good discipline as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th thank you so much for talking about that. I think um, we've got some audience questions, which I think are quite linked, um, maybe on the kind of working for deadline thing. Um, so I don't know if uh, Carol Jones, could you unmute yourself and um, maybe ask a question that you had put in the chat? Hello there. Um, you come across as being <laughs> um, you come across as being very passionate and curious about all of your your subjects and all of your programs. When it comes to putting together a program like In Our Time. How do you edit all of that research to the final program? Well, it's difficult. It's like, uh, it's, that's one of the reasons I like In Our Time, because it, I mean, I, 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 it may, it's, it, it's, it's hard work, but the result is always worth it because you get to know something. I mean, you get to know something. So how do I edit it? Well, first of all, the, there's, a, there's an editor, there's a, a producer. At the moment, the producer is Simon Tillotson, who's an extra terrific producer. Uh, and then he works out a structure and and uh, um, and he, there are research documents come in from the participants. They say, well, we think this is this, and so it's about 40, 50 pages of those. And then I look at it and try to absorb it and, uh, and then put it in a certain order um, and then go for it. Um, we used to do it live. We did it live until a year or so ago when I got quite ill and they decided to uh, record it. In case I <laughs> couldn't make the, the 43 minutes. So, and we stayed recording it because of this carry on that we're in the middle of. Um, this, um, I think it's, it's, it's not easy. It's one of the reasons I have to drive on. Sometimes I feel I'm being rude and these emeritus professor of what's it, emeritus, emeritus professor of what's up, what's else. And I'm saying, no, I, that isn't right. Can we do that? And that's a bit, but the, the thing about in our time that really works is that the academic community in this country have made it their own. That program works because three very, very clever academics at a high level uh, are talking about the subject they know as much about probably as anybody on the planet. And they're willing to dive in and give their best to the interchange between the three of them. They know I'm not going to talk about their books. They know I'm not going to let them plug anything. Uh, and so on, and, and they are very, very good. And I've, I've done this, uh, take this to other places. There's another country in the world can touch it for the academic uh, uh, elasticity of mind and willingness to join in. No, no, they ponder away. They, you know, there's these sort of programs. I don't want to name other countries, but they're really grim and boring and they don't get anywhere. This gets a long way. And now we have an extra bit, um, the um, make it, make, make the thing at the end, so podcast, so it's, it's an hour goes around. And that's that next to the BBC World News, that is the biggest selling podcast in the BBC, all around the world. China's just bought it, can you imagine? <laughs> I bet they show the one, I bet they want to play the one about the Cultural Revolution, they should lead with that. Anyway, so it's because they're good. And I steer it with the producer's help. Uh, and sometimes I feel a bit uh, rude, not rude, no. They all realize we're trying to get somewhere. And what we try to do is to deliver to people who have, 
and the letters and letters and letters you get from people i didn't go to didn't have didn't go to university i didn't have but i they keep up this way that sort of thing to try to deliver to those people something that they hadn't had from from the very best speakers and uh, that's that's a great feeling when when uh, um when you can do that uh, and i think we can sometimes uh, i think we can and it's what they do uh, and so packing it together which is your original question you just have to be very i'm doing it now doing i'm preparing a program marcus aurelius well marcus aurelius life is longer than our street so you have to say well i can't do that i we can do that about Seneca, but oh, I don't think we do that. And I know we can't do the, the, the campaign in the East. No, we can't do it. And you, what you do is compress and compress. And then you go in and hope, hope for the best. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you're, you're right that the, the real the sort of sternness is a, a, you're like definitely why the program works so well. I think as a student, it's quite heartening. Um, to sort of see the tutorial system being kind of inverted and sort of seeing academics getting a bit of a grid in. Um, and I think now we're going to pass on to Mark Finn Kelsey, who I think is a big fan of the show as well. Um, and he wanted to ask a question about kind of what your favourites have been. So if you could unmute Mark and uh, ask your question. Hi, hi, yeah, I love the show. I think it's brilliant. I've, um, it's been great in some of my essays done at university and I think it's just an amazing resource. Um, yeah, good, Thank I you. was. <laughs> that's okay um i was just wondering what your favorite shows have been you've done and what sort of subjects you you like the most um i, I think some of the ones on paintings and culture have been brilliant those would be my favorites well again like the answer i gave earlier <laughs> about, uh, about books um i am uh the fact is i there's nothing i don't like about them and i think it's it's you just have to accept that that's the truth or don't. If you don't, you don't. That's fine. If you do, that is the truth. We, Simon and I pick the subjects together and basically it's guided by what I'd like, what we'd like to know about. You know, oh, I'd like to know and I'd like to know about uh, gravitational pull. We'd like to know about uh, what's happening in China in, in the time of the Great Warlords. We'd like to know. About, so let's do that and let's do that and let's do that. And that's the way. So in terms of if I had to choose favorites, I would choose the hard sciences because I, 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 stopped, I, I, I stopped doing physics when I was 14. It was, a very, as I said, a very small grammar school and you couldn't do this and the other together. Um, and I was quite good at maths, but I couldn't do that in the sixth form because they say you can't do maths, you've got to do Latin. And I've always had a yen to know more about that. So when we get talking about eclipses or when we get talking um, about the, the way the solar system works, or when we get talking about anything to do with hard science, then I'm most interested because I start from a position of zero and come into the studio thinking, what on earth do I think I'm doing here? And I really do think that even now, I think at the age of 81, I mean, I've got a terrible one coming, not only in our time, but it could be um, um, interviewing Roger Penrose, who's just won a Nobel Prize. He's been on in our time. And going to talk to him about his in in in, in Wadham. His Wadham's giving a celebration for him, and uh, reading his stuff about the black hole and about his work with Stephen Hawkins and so on. It's like reading uh, Albanian, but you've just got to get a grip on it. And and and, and what's that? Uh, I rely on, wasn't it Blanche Dubois? I rely on the generosity of strangers. Yes, that's me. I'm Blanche Dubois. Speaking of Thank which, uh, Rohan. Rohan Royale has a question about um, guests, if you'd like to unmute, Rohan. Sorry. Hi there, yeah, yeah. I just um, have a question of um, about the guests you had on In Our Time. Um, so who, who was the uh, smartest or almost memorable guest uh, you had on, on the show? Well, these are, I mean, if I say somebody uh, given that we've had, let's say, a thousand shows to make it easy, so that makes uh, 3,000 people. I'm going to offend 2,999 people. Um, the, some of them, it's, honestly, I just find the questions hardest to answer, like my favourite film. I don't know. Uh, I can give you my 10 favourite films I like best, but I can't do it. Sometimes the, 
I'm, I, I feel I'm letting you down, but I can't help without, without Philip. Um, I'm very, I'm very, there's a man called Frank Close, who's a physicist, and he, when we did the, on the program on eclipses recently, he goes around the world um, uh, following eclipses, as it were. So, and he's got a genius, apart from what he's done in his work, for managing to explain the most complicated things about the planets, not in the simplest way. None of these people are simple. We're explaining in ways which are understandable, and uh, to me, and and I therefore assume to everybody else. Uh, he's good. But there are so many that are so good. They're rare. I, I, I wish I could say more. A lot of them come from the place you're in now. I mean, that that's that's just so good. And they've joined in. The thing is that they joined. They joined in. They realise what it is. It's a it's a colloquy. It's not a seminar. It's not a conversation. It's not an interview. Uh, that's where it is a colloquy. They dive in and they do. So, um, sorry, I can't help. Except Frank Close. I like Frank. Um, thank you for that, Melvin. Um, if we could have Imogen's question now, uh, which is kind of related in our time, but also kind of thinking about your career more generally. Um, Imogen, if you could, un Imogen Hunter Jones, if you'd unmute. Hello. Um, thanks so um, much. So I was wondering, uh, having read history and then gone on to a successful media career um, and in the arts more generally, uh, it's kind of a twofold question. Are you a concerned with the government's emphasis on science and practical subjects as a preference to art subjects? And also, are you optimistic that the arts will ever recover post COVID? Um, something I assume you care about quite a lot. I'm sure. So, so your question, I didn't get the first part of it clearly. Do I think the arts have a future at un on the university curriculum? Um, yeah, more generally, as in, you know, the government's putting such an emphasis on STEM. Yeah. Do you think that that will have a negative impact on the potential devaluing of arts and education and wider society? So like that twofold with COVID, um, how do we think the cultural landscape is going to pan out or is there still going to be a place for us? Well, um, I'm, if I knew how the cultural landscape was going to pan out, I, I promise I'd tell you first. <laughs> <laughs> I have not the slightest idea. It's such a mess and it's being made more of a mess in this country by incompetence. I put that to one side. Um, I think that the art subjects will never go away uh, because too many people want to do it, to, the arts want to do them. Uh, and we'll do them one way and another. And the people in charge of tertiary education, university or college or academy education, will see that and want, want to house them and train them, <coughs> train them to the next stage, whether it's David Hockney going to the academy or whether it's people going to university to, to study philosophy or whatever it is, they'll take them on. So I think the future is secure at what uh, level, at what level of, of investment and possibility is a different thing. And what, what you're in there is a sort of, basically, you're in a catfight. Those who are running these departments have got to fight for them. They really, I was um, um, uh, um, in, ch um, what are they called? Not, not Regis Professor, I was a Chancellor of Leeds University for 15 years, uh, um, which is unpaid job, which you don't do much except turn up and, uh, and talk. Um, and I learned a lot there. And one thing is that the departments which, who are led by people committed to doing it, have a better chance. Um, people don't really, in, in authority, don't really like saying no when there's a force coming at them. They don't. And I think if you're those in charge of your departments, if they're forceful enough, then they will succeed. Uh, as they've succeeded so magnificently in various in chemistry and in, in, in medicine and in and so, but also in look at Oxford that it's produced some wonderful historians and philosophers and so on. I think it's it's all a matter of of, of, of commitment and also in certain areas things maybe have snowballed a bit too much and maybe there is things to time to strip back a bit here. And I don't know, I would hope not, but maybe there is. But that isn't the end of things. You know, it's like pruning a rosary, isn't it? It could be the beginning of things. Speaking of success, uh, thank you. Thank you for the response. Uh, speaking of success, 
Uh, Gracie Bolt has a question if you'd like to unmute. Hi, yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether you had one piece of advice that you've carried with you throughout your career and one piece of advice that you'd wish you'd been given other than maybe reading up on Albania before a BBC interview. So can you say that again, please? I didn't quite get it. One piece Sorry. of advice that I would give to you. You've carried with you throughout your career and one piece of advice that you'd wish you'd been given. I get the first one. I didn't, still haven't got the second. <laughs> that you wish you'd been given, but uh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The one piece of advice that, 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 that the only thing I can say is that, and it is really, it's, I mean, you, resist, you resist the obvious at your peril. And the piece of advice is, if you believe in it, don't give in. Don't give in. Because it's good enough that you believe in it. And just keep going, keep nagging away at it. The number of artists I've spoken to, and I must have spoken to thousands now, and some of them, very eminent, very, they didn't give in. They did the seventh draft of their first novel. They just didn't give in. And I think that's the best advice for that. Why advice I wish I'd been given? Um, <laughs> where do you start? Um, I wish I'd been, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I'd been, a, mm, I wish I hadn't jumped at every opportunity that came my way because I couldn't resist. Would you like to do a film? Sure, I'll have a go. Uh, would you like to, play? yeah, I'd like to try to write a play for the, for the, that, that theatre. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I should have said no. I'm, I'd like to finish my novel first. Thank you very much. Um, I should have liked to have done that more than, more than once. I'd like in my earlier novels, some of them, to have rewritten them. I think I didn't, I wrote, but I didn't rewrite enough. It's okay now, but you know, there isn't much time to do much more. Only you never know, you can peg away. Thank you very so much. So the first is that, and the second, the second advice is to, for me to, it's very difficult when you're, I mean, opportunity is, is, is the real siren call, isn't it? If you get opportunities, you think, uh, I'd better take this on another opportunity might not come. Nobody will ever ask me to do a television program again, so I'll do this one, even though it isn't quite what I want. It'll be something to start with. Uh, oh, somebody wants me to do that. Well, I'll, I'll try to. They want me to write this piece. That, well, I'll have, ask. And so you're you're testing around. And uh, I think I would have I would have I wanted I would have liked a little mechanism that did more culling than it did. On the other hand, you are where you are, and and you know I think if I'd organised my life, I'd be even a worse mess than a disorganised life. At least you go with something when you're disorganized. When you're organized, you go with it. No, no, no. That's not a very good answer, but good luck anyway. That is very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. That's, I think that's fantastic advice. Um, could we move on to Jacob's question now? Uh, I'm looking at Jacob uh, Gretsch's question. Um, if you wouldn't mind unmuting. Um, hey, sure. Um, so um, Melvin, I just wanted to ask about your um, your time in the House of Lords, having spent more than um, more than twenty years in in the House of Lords, has that changed um, any fundamental way your your views of um, Britain's institutions and perhaps the role of broadcasting um, in 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 those institutions and related to those institutions? Yes, it has. First of all, I think the the, the thing is, I mentioned the Lords because uh, the the Labour government said they were going to spend real money on the arts. And they hadn't anybody on the Lords in the Lords who was proposing, defending. And they asked David Putnam, uh, they asked myself, about four or five of us, would we go in? to put, And we did. And we brought debates up and we had some sort of impact. So that's one thing. Uh, I think the Lords as a debating house is far superior to the Commons. Uh, it has people uh, who are at the top of their game in heads of, uni heads of universities or their top lawyers or their top solicitors or their... And they, and they, they're great, and some very very fine thinkers there on both sides. The downside is that if you have a um, government which is bigoted and uh, well, I don't, then they don't take any notice of them. If you look what the Lords has done over the last year, <laughs> for instance, they've been sensible, 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 and sensible. And what the Commons have said, no, 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 we'll go our way. So that gets a bit disappointing. You think, oh, well. Um, on the other hand, 
let me start at another angle. Um, I don't, being called the House of Lords is, is way, let's stop all that. But you do need a second chamber. You do need a revising chamber. The stuff comes up from the elected chamber, which must always be supreme. But you do need to revise it. That's the biggest thing I've learned from the Lords. The stuff that they push through from the Commons is often not very well written, not very well thought through, not comprehensive enough. And the people in the Lords who come in who know about this stuff because they've spent their life doing it, amend it. Sometimes in one term, we've sent eight or 900 amendments down there and the, the Commons take them on. You need a revising chamber, but uh, it doesn't need to be called the House of Lords. It doesn't need all the ermine. Um, it doesn't need that, but you need that second chamber. And until they get round to have, until they get round to the sense of doing that, uh, we suck with what we've got. But what we've got is some very fine people, but also because of the way it's constituted, it doesn't have anything like the influence that its work merits. That's my view. Thank you very much. So interesting. And I guess that kind of links back to your position as a life peer and how the, the Lords has changed over the years. Um, well, it's yeah. changed. It's, it, yes, I think a lot of the life peers do very, very good stuff. And some of the, uh, some of the hereditaries who, who stayed on are ex excellent speakers and they've got good ideas to put forward. Yeah. Um, I think it's much more dynamic and much more um, informed on a broader set of subjects than it was when it had, what was it, 900 hereditaries there. On the other hand, the big thing is we can't be effective enough. Even when we're advising chamber, part of a constitution that the Commons had to take notice of, then we'd be getting somewhere. They take notice of us, but they don't have to. And they don't have to take us into account. And that's very frustrating. Could we get just one question from Isabella Simpson, please? I know you've posted a lot in the chat. Um, yeah, I think most of mine have um, been answered now, but um, I think one of the main ones I was going to ask was, as a musician, I have been told, you know, this dream is not attainable, this is not that. And I was just wondering what one piece of advice would be to all of us who have dreams and have aspirations um, from you. You're told that this is not, a, this is not available. Sorry, it was, I didn't, couldn't quite get that. Maybe these headphones are getting in the way anyway. Can you have another go at some of it? Sorry. Um, I was just saying that, you know, as someone in the arts, I have been told that my dreams are unattainable and that, you know. Well, who told you that? Um, I, get, I get told quite a lot. I've been told by people at school and people. Yeah, well, they're wrong. Outside. Um, they're all wrong. I mean, they, uh, you just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I mean that, and I'm not just encouraging you, and I'm not being, I'm just not being Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not Mr. Nice Guy about this sort of thing at all. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. People come from all sorts of arts and parts, from all sorts of corners, from all sorts of advantage and disadvantage, and they go through the door that takes them to what they want. Yeah. And if people stop in the way of young people and say, you can't do this, you can't do that, they should be struck down immediately. And got out of the way. It's wrong. And Yates, when he got poems in from people, he said, encourage, encourage, encourage. And he was absolutely right. You cannot do that to young people because you never know. You never really know. I mean, a young person, people of your age, write something. Um, and if you're very lucky, it's good. Uh, and even if it's good, it's not what you're going to write in 10 years' time. If you get a bit of confidence, it's a first, good no, God knows you could... You know, you could turn out to be quite a wonderful writer. It's just, no, you've got to be encouraged. No, and if nobody else to encourage you, encourage yourself. Yeah. Do. I mean, don't, don't, don't be put off, really. It's easy to put people off. It's like it's easy to say mean things about people's work. That's easy. The hard thing is to say, come on, come with it. And you people have taken uh, difficult office jobs and written or painted. Uh, or done music and so on and come through. No, no. And even if you don't come through and have leave reviews in this, that, and the other, and I say, you're still doing what you want. Yeah. You're still finding in yourself the satisfaction to do what you want to do, which is wonderful. 
And then, whether you're good or not, well, that's in the lap of the gods for everybody. But doing it is what matters. And don't be put off doing it. Just don't. If you really want to do it, do it. And tell them all to bugger off. Maybe use rather, rather more polite terms. But I mean it. People shouldn't tell you you can't do it, you're not up to it, there's no opportunity. People have come from all over the all over the social spectrum, especially now when people are breaking it all over the place. Some television writers, and some novelists and poets, they come from all everywhere. Every every part of our society and doing it and doing it well. Um, and uh, you know, look at I just made a film, well a few well a year or so with uh, Bernadine Evaristo. Um, well Bernadine's background was, you know, <laughs> Very difficult. Mixed race, eight children, East End, dum de dum, left school at sixty. And look at her. She just stuck at it, kept going, writing poetry, starting, and she's she's turned out with wonderful work. No, oh, no, 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 no. People, sh and she was encouraged all along the way by this person, that person, the other person, or by her friends. The greatest source of encouragement was her two or three friend, best friends, as I understand it. I'm not an authority on her I life, but I'm still her best friends. So, no, 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 don't let people tell you. Don't, don't let them. Don't, don't. And I met, when I said, bugger off, that was rude. Um, but just, they, they must get out of your way. Get out of your life. Just, yeah. you know, as Diogenes said to Alexander, when Alexander great said, what can I do for you? As you know, uh, uh, I said in the battle, I said, you can stand out of my life. You don't have to stand out of your light. Thank you. Yeah, that's just fantastic advice. Thank you so much, Marvin. Um, I'm aware that we're kind of we've managed to make it to five o'clock already, and um, there are quite there are quite a lot of other questions in the chat. Well, I'm happy to, ha to hang on for a few minutes if yeah. you want to. Oh, fine. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, maybe we could have Freddie next. If, um, Hi. Yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, your experience. Um. At Wadham, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, your time in college there, as a fellow Wadhamite. Are you a fellow Wadhamite? <laughs> well, it was a bit of a shock at the start. I mean, it was all male. I'd never been in an all male society. Um, it was uh, mostly at those days. You're talking about 1958. It was almost all public school. Um, um, you ate communally in hall and so on. all that that sort of stuff. It didn't take very long for that to disappear. Uh, partly because of, of groups. As I said, I played a bit of rugby. We, we had a good rugby team at school. In fact, we had five, in, five boy internationals at school. Um, as I played a bit of rugby and was in a choir, that dropped away. Both of those dropped away after a year. But you bump into a lot of people. Then I was fortunate with people I met up with who were just very good, became good friends. And they, and all of them, I think, had been to private school or independent school. And they're still my best friends from Oxford today. Um, so that was taken care of, uh, in terms of the teaching, uh, cause I wanted to learn stuff that was very, very good and drifting around. Oh, you spoiled for choice. I mean, did you belong to this society or that society or that society or all three of them? What did you do? So my experience at Wadham was, uh, the first year I was, um, bewildered by, uh, the range of choices and the range of things you could do at a higher level, which is one of the reasons I dropped rugby and singing. I was, you know, I, was, I enjoyed singing in a choir in Wickham. I enjoyed playing in rugby in Wickham, but these guys were serious. I mean, but that day, some of them were playing for England. Uh, so get, getting to, into the history society, getting into uh, drama where people knew, really knew what they were doing. Uh, so the opportunities were, were to, and writing for Charlotte, um, they, they had high standards there. So I thought it was a, a treasure box, really. Um, I was lonely sometimes. I mean, in many ways, I didn't think it was interesting as Wigdon, um, this town of 5,000 people. It wasn't as, well, because I didn't know the structures. I didn't know the inner life of Oxford, as I, I thought I did, the town I came from. But no, I, 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 uh, once I get used to it, I just, I am, um, I thought I was very lucky. Um, uh, and, and I met some good friends and that was a big thing. And then I managed to do some of the things I wanted, like write and 
been in films and plays and such. Um, and then, then you're off, aren't you? And then you're off. Sorry, it was a, a it's, it's a good story. I know this is very, <laughs> but it's a good and positive story. I mean, I had bad times, but I'm not, not going to burden you with that. The, the old, the old uh, nervous thing came up once or twice, which is, wasn't, any, wasn't any fun at all. Um, and it was difficult sometimes. Not all that difficult, not really difficult. I mean, when you've been, now this is, this is for parody, strictly for parody. <laughs> when you've brought up with people who go down the pits, really do, I work in a factory as a cog, really, at a machine, or oh, like my mother clean houses all the time, you hesitate before you say other things are difficult. <laughs> exactly. It wasn't difficult compared with, with what, I, what I'd known. It wasn't difficult at all. It was a, basically a joy uh, with, um, you know, little shades along the way. Thank you so much. It's really and also just to finish this, I'm never, never, never tired of walking around Oxford. Just walking around and looking at it. I'm thinking, wow, all these people have been there. Oh, there's an alley down there and go down there. I can go in this, just wander around, just looking at it, amazed. This, this great structure to scholarship. I thought, isn't it an amazing place to be? Thank you. Thank you so much, Melvin. Um, we, me and Ollie had just one more question for you, um, if you have time for it. Uh, yeah sort of we we you know you've been president for um the charity mind for 15 years sort of till 2011 i think um and obviously me and Ollie both um along with lots of people on this call uh, edit for student newspapers so um we have like, the good fortune of reading lots of people's sort of uh, exceptional creative content um and in this kind of time this pandemic time where lots of people are having mental health sort of um issues could you talk very you know just to wrap up about kind of the importance of finding creative voice um the importance of mind yeah or talking you know about finding sort of creative voice as a uh, antidote if you like to sort of mental health struggles well the mind is uh can i talk about that because there's so much there's so many questions inside your question of course, yeah. right, talk Thank about you. mind i i i joined uh, cumberland mind uh, oh god for 30 years ago now uh, and did a bit there, but not much because I was living in London. And then we, Mind asked me if I would go on there executive. Then I was president of Mind. And the interesting thing about it at that stage, and that I was president of Mind, then I handed over to see prior president of Mind, let's say 25 years ago for 15 years. I think at that stage is that it was a pariah organization. And one of the fascinating things when you get to my age is the way you see things change. It was a pariah organization. I remember we used to have a book uh, um, lunch every year. I, mean, I, I got very good judges, uh, really smashing judges. Uh, some of the best writers would come and judge uh, and there'd be about 60 or 70 books coming in about, about mental health, health issues and we'd have a little lunch uh, in some borrowed space somewhere uh, and it went very well. Uh, uh, and we flew, got paid people's, uh, we didn't pay them any fees, but the, the, the shortlist, uh, uh, anyway, we, we did it. And one year, we could not get 3,000, we could not raise, we went around the usual sponsors, and we went around the big companies, and we went around everywhere. We could not raise 5,000 pounds. It was not available. They didn't want to be part of it they didn't want to be part of mental health issues. They didn't want their companies to be associated with it. It was extraordinary to discover that. And even those of us who were running it, well, we, were, we were okay, as it were, but they didn't want anything to do with it. So we dug into our own back pockets and got that money and did the thing. Now, since then, two or three things have happened of momentous importance in this area. Really momentous. It's good to say these things. Um, the, the attitude towards mental health has changed so much that it's unrecognizable and it's changed for the better. People now understand that people can be afflicted as if you have a broken arm or if you're, in, if you're mentally disturbed in some way. But this is something that damage that has to be attended to and healed. 
Now, that seems so obvious, but now more and more and more and more people realize that. And it's recognized as something that's out there, as, as, as a problem, as an illness, something that is on the agenda, that's not right and has to be, that's one thing that's changed, it has changed. Second thing is, the great sponsors, and I mean the great sponsors, people who give a lot, who now want to be part of mine. I mean, the, I still talk at things when Stephen's, um, and I, I, we got 34 million from people, and, and you nearly always came to the same thing, their niece or their sister's cousin was in a bad way. And they saw mind as a way through. Once you get that connection, it isn't, you can't get it cynically. It comes about because society changes. Once you've got that connection, they said, oh yes, this is worth supporting. We'll give you a million. We'll invite you to, we'll do this, that and the other. That's the other big change. And it's got a very good CEO, Paul Farmer, who's there and I was, he's, he's terrific. And so that, those are the big changes in the organization that deals with mind. Has to do with the actual dealing of the mental distress itself. Well, it's too big a subject and, and I don't know enough about it to say anything more than uh, I'm glad it's recognized. I'm glad it's being treated. It's still horrible and, and, and frighteningly lonely. Uh, and the more we take it into us, like a broken arm, the better. Well, thank, thank you, Marvin, for um, coming to our Q&A. It's been so lovely to speak with you and have our questions on. I don't quite know it's going. Um, um, just, just. Just to say, we the Oxford Blue have another event. We're really short. We're, I think I think we've we've kept too long enough. I'm I'm just trying to wrap up. Um, yeah, but it's been it's been so lovely to talk to you, and you have such a heartwarming message to put out into the world. It's been really lovely, and I'm sure everyone in the audience really appreciates it. So thank you so much. Um, um, any any last couple of words? Well, just thank you for having me. I've enjoyed talking to you, and uh, there you are. Thank you very much. Good luck. Good luck. Ah, that's the big thing. Remember to read the article before you go into the interview. <laughs>